Amen. Love becomes most real when it gives. Love becomes most real when it gives. Eight-year-old boy who loved skateboarding and loved playing ball was living his life, yet there was a part of his life where he was distraught. His six-year-old sister was lying in a hospital bed with leukemia that was pretty desperate for her. And he was aware of this, and he was praying for it every single day and praying for her, hoping that, that things would get better for her. Yet, they had tested all of the family members to see whether their blood matched her blood type so that maybe a transfusion could be given to her so that she could continue prolonging her life. But there were no family members whose blood matched. And so mom and dad sat down with their eight-year-old son and said, son, would you be willing to have your blood tested to see whether it matches your sister? He says, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. They would go to the doctor and they test out his blood and they see that he is a perfect match for her, to be, for her to be able to have a blood transfusion from him. So the parents come home and they sit down with the little boy and they say, were you willing to donate your blood so that she can be able to do better and her maybe be able to find her life back? And he says, well, can I think about it overnight? And he goes to bed and he prays about it and he thinks about it and he wakes up the next morning and he goes to mom and dad and he says, yes, I'm willing to give my blood so that she can find life. So they take him to the hospital beside his sister in the gurney, and they lay him down, and they place the IV in his arm, and he watches the blood dripping from his arm into hers, into her IV, into her arm, and he closes his eyes, and he begins to just wonder. And the doctor comes over to him and just wants to check him out to make sure he's okay, and the little boy opens his eyes, and he asks, how soon till I start to die? Love becomes most real when it gives. We love to be loved. We love to be appreciated. We love to be respected. We love to be needed. And when we don't feel that coming towards us in other ways, we build these powerful walls around us to protect ourselves from being hurt from somebody else. Because we appreciate being loved, and when we don't find it being reciprocated to us, we begin to wonder what's going on in our lives. There are at least two truths about every human being that matter deeply. The first truth is that all of us have spiritual leukemia. All of us. None of us can avoid that problem and that pain. We are flawed, we are broken, we are scarred, we are bent. Ever since the sin of Adam and Eve, every single member of the human race has lived from that point with the reality that all of us suffer the consequences of sin, the darkness and the gloom and the storm of life affect us and fill us in every way. We have been born into a world that brings spiritual sickness and heartache and pain as we have been chosen and chosen to infect ourselves by our own choices of life. All of our parents have let us down. We are scarred and bent and broken because every parent, parent, no regardless of how well they have tried, has still broken and bruised us. Every school does the same thing. Every adult does the same thing. Every coach breaks their children down as they're on their soccer field or the football field or the baseball diamond. And guess what? Every church does the same thing. Regardless of our intent, regardless of us trying to be able to help, regardless of us trying to pray and to be a blessing, there's still times that we'll say something that someone will take the wrong way, or maybe we said something in the wrong kind of way and we hurt other people. The first truth is, is that we all have spiritual leukemia. The second truth is, is that we have never been abandoned by God. Never. Never been abandoned by God. We may again feel that we've been abandoned. We may feel that life is not going the way we'd like for it to, but God has always been there at our side wanting to help us through every single moment of our lives. God has seen and He sees and He will always see the, spark, the problem that all of us get into by our own choices of life and how desperately we need salvation from our sins. When God created the world and Jesus spoke it into existence, and the Holy Spirit roamed over the faces of the, of the face of the water, God created a perfect world, one you and I cannot relate with. There are only two people in the world ever who've existed and lived in that kind of world. 
in which there were no tornadoes, no earthquakes, no hurricanes, no fire. Adam never went to bed at night and wondered, well, I wonder if Eve really loves me. There was no fear of losing the job, no wonderment of going to a mailbox and wondering, has everything, has everything okay? Am I going to get a, you know, a, a notice of foreclosure, a notice of inflation or whatever? They didn't worry about eggs going up you know, to $11.50 a dozen kind of scenario. Never worried about any of those things that you and I worry about today. Adam and Eve did get to work as they tended the Garden of Eden from Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. But there was nothing to worry about. The things that we wake up at night and we wonder about and we have anxiety anxiety about, Adam and Eve never had it. No impending disaster or worry of a terrorist attack. No worry about inflation or what the government might do next. No worry about a gigantic balloon floating over our country. No worries about any of those kinds of things for them. Can you imagine living in that kind of world? How much additional sleep you'd get? How real rest you could have? That you didn't have to worry about having a heart attack or a stroke or cancer affecting your body or if your spouse decided to fall in love with somebody else and turned to leave you or where your money was all going to go or someone getting it, breaking into your bank account and stealing all of your money or taking your mortgage. So go on with LifeLock. All of those kinds of things we don't have to worry about because of God. But they lived in that kind of a world. No cancer, no heartaches, no heart attack, no COVID-19, no appendicitis. Sorry, Dr. Lisa, you wouldn't have a job in the Garden of Eden. If you're doing repairs, no repairman in the Garden of Eden because all of those things are taken care of. Genesis 2.25 says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. We can't relate in that well because we've never lived there. But we were created in the same way that Adam and Eve were created, and we were created for the Garden of Eden, but we don't live there. Notice the passage from Genesis chapter 3. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, Who is this? What is this you have done? And spiritual leukemia began. Our fears came. Our blame came. Our need to hide came. God knew this would happen and built into this very perfect world a counter system that the world would turn topsy-turvy, 180 degrees on its head, that all the things that Adam and Eve were able to avoid, now they can no longer avoid, and that you and I, because we are still made in the image of God and continue to live in that kind of world, suffer the consequences of their sin and our sin of the spiritual leukemia. We became bruised that would not heal, We became bent that a doctor could not fix. We became fearful that all the therapy in the world could not resolve. We became broken that no hospital could resolve. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. They were made in that image and they had this perfect picture of what life was like because that's the kind of world that they lived in. And the same desires that were in Adam and Eve for peace and prosperity and calmness and and racial justice and all the things that we want so desperately for our world to have, they had until they chose the darkness of sin. And that is why we struggle when life isn't perfect. That's why we struggle when five police officers kill a man on the street. That's why we suffer and we struggle when people break into stores and and, and hammer and do all kinds of things and take things that they shouldn't be taking because they're not theirs. 
That's why we struggle when we see racial injustice and we see old people being beaten and we see young people being abused and we see racial conflict and all the human trafficking and all the things that we struggle with in life. Guess what? And I hate to say it. All of our prayers are not going to stop these problems. All of our giving money and doing a thing, God, doesn't, God wants us to do those things. He says, the poor you'll always have with you and, and give and share and care for all these people, but we won't solve the problem because sin is still in the world and Satan still has control over so many people. It doesn't mean that we don't care and we don't give, but we will never solve the world's problems because Satan is still alive and even in the church, He can turn our minds and our hearts to begin to think bad thoughts about somebody else within the body. And the only thing that can ever destroy a church is Satan getting inside of our heads and allowing him to take control of our lives. We were not created broken and bent and diseased. We have chosen to have all of those things in our lives by choosing sin. And our identity is not that we are broken. Brokenness and disease is not our destiny. We may be unlovely, but we are not unloved. Let me repeat that. We may be unlovely, but we are not unloved. John 3, 16, the verse we all have so much, I'm sure, memorized. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him won't perish but have eternal life. God gives us a love we do not deserve or could earn, or do enough good things to receive. God loves us because we are His sons and His daughters, and because He cared enough for us to send His Son to go to a cross to die for us. That was the only way He could have an eternal relationship with us. Because of Jesus, we are whole and complete in every way. Do you believe that? We mentally know it. We mentally acknowledge that we are whole and complete in our relationship with God. But living it out, it's a whole other world. Living it out in each other's lives is a whole other problem. It's a whole other strategy we have to figure out how to be able to do. We can mentally assert it, but being able to practically deliver it in our lives is a whole other thing. God gives us our value. God gives us our worth. God gives us our hope. God gives us our peace. And in God's eyes, we are priceless treasures. Today, we'll take a look in John chapter 8 as we move to that place now in our scripture today, where Jesus will encounter people who are trying to trap him and have brought a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery. So let's begin reading this from John chapter 8. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you that is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir, neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So picture the scene with me. At the dawn of the day, Jesus is out there in the temple courts. He has people who have gathered around him as they want to be able to pray or they want to be able to talk about God. And he's sharing with them messages from God, giving them hope and reconciliation for the lives that they've lived and being able to show them who God is. All of a sudden, they begin to hear this ruckus somewhere in the distance. They begin to hear this crying and screaming and yelling and accusation and all these angry voices beginning to come out in the crowd. And somewhere down around the corner in a room is a man and a woman having sex. 
And there within that scene, all of a sudden come rushing in the religious leaders. They come rushing into the, through the door and they catch this woman and this man in this act. And they grab the woman but forget the man. Because most likely the man was set up to be a part of this scene so they could trap Jesus. They take her without any clothes on. They drag her down the hall. They take her out into the street. And she's trying to cover her body in some kind of a way to protect herself from any more shame. She has no idea what's about to take place. She has no idea if she's about to be stoned and where they're taking her and what the demise is going to take place. All she knows is is that she's been with this man. We don't know the story behind it. We don't know whether she has prostituted herself because her husband has died and she needs desperately to to find money to be able to take care of her, her children. We have no idea whether she maybe actually loved this guy and was just simply there and being in part of this sexual act that took place. But as they drag her out and they drag her down the street, the shop owners come out and they begin to take a look and they're wondering what's going on and the people shopping for their wares are all there and she's trying to cover herself up and the accusations and it gets louder and louder as they come around the corner and they see Jesus. And Jesus has stopped his message that he's been giving He's been interrupted many, many times before. And as they bring her around the corner, all eyes are on this woman. Wives are covering their husband's eyes and their children's eyes, trying to make sure that they don't see what they shouldn't see. And the accusations continue to come around. And Jesus, as he is standing there, they throw her in front of him and they make her stand up. And they come to her and they they come to Jesus and they all want to know, what are you going to do about this? Remember who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He was one who helped establish the laws and the rules of the Old Testament principles. He knew exactly what God said and what exactly should have been done to be able to keep wrong from infiltrating the camp and being a part of the community of of people at that time. And all are wondering, would he hear the accusation and be so disgusted at this woman? Would he himself want to pick up a stone and stone her? Would he want to cause the crowd to, come on, we need to be right in this and make sure that we we stop this accusation, we stop these rumors from kind of going on here in the world. What would Jesus do? Scripture says they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They were trying to trap Jesus. They've tried it numerous times. They'd ask him questions and then Jesus would answer and they'd come back with another question. Well, who is my neighbor? And they'd want to know, well, how come your disciples don't wash their hands like we tell them to wash their hands? And why is it that you're healing this person on the Sabbath? You shouldn't do those kinds of things. And why is it that you you sent the demons into the pigs and they ran down into the water and drowned? Why are you doing those kinds of things? But now they ratchet it up one more level. They decide to bring a live person before Jesus who's been caught in a sin that would be just dreadful even in our day today. And they bring her before him, standing there wanting to know And their question is, now, what do you say? What do you say? If you were Jesus, what would you say? Would you want to point out their sin and give them condemnation and give them judgment to tell them exactly where they're going and why they're going and all those kinds of things? And imagine being this woman for a few moments. You know your guilt You know your darkness. You know why you did it, and you know you've been caught, and you wonder now what's about to take place inside of you. You're naked, you're afraid, you're trapped. And she's trying desperately to cover her nakedness, but she can't. What happens next is amazing. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. We too often spend way too much time trying to figure out what he wrote. The principle is he took the eyes off of the woman and put it on himself. He was refusing to allow those people to push his buttons and to make him angry and frustrated. He had chosen instead to cast the eyes in a whole other direction. 
Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus points out the obvious that they had forgotten. They are sinners as well. They're not just sinners in a general kind of way. They're sinners in this act. They were part of the setup of this woman being caught in the act of adultery. They knew they'd sent this guy in there, and they knew that when they came into the room, they would push him aside and let him get his clothes back on. He may even be part of the crowd that's there with the stones in their hands ready to accuse her of what she has done. They were guilty of the conception of this scene as well as the judgment and the condemnation of this woman. They're simply trying to trap Jesus one more time. If you are without sin, cast the first stone. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? From the oldest in the crowd who brought this woman to the very youngest, the oldest began to recognize their own sin. They heard Jesus. They heard His message. They heard exactly what He was saying, and they knew that it was pointed right at them. And the older ones first dropped their rocks, and they began to walk away. And they all walked away with their heads lowered, and Jesus again had won the battle. The woman was still standing there, did not know what Jesus would say to her. Her mind is still wondering. Can you imagine being her at this moment with this question? Has no one condemned you? All of us have been there. We've all been condemned by somebody else in the church, in the world, in our families, in our relationships, in our marriages, between parents and children, between bosses and employees. We've all been condemned. We've all had our mistakes pointed out to us in different kinds of ways. All of us have seen our own raggedness and disease and brokenness and bentness. And some of us, in fact, I think all of us, have been a point of have been a part of pointing fingers at somebody else, their mistakes and their failures as well. Jesus loves us. Our brokenness is obvious, and oh, how we need the love of our Savior. John 8, 11 says, No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Many of you here today have heard those words from Jesus. Neither do I condemn you. God knows all about us. He knows our choices and our sins and our hurt to others and each other. And we are all in the same boat. All of us are in the same boat. We all have spiritual leukemia and need a blood transfusion that has been given to us by Jesus. We will not receive it from the church. You won't receive it from a school. You won't receive it from a spouse. You won't receive it from a friend. Only in Jesus can we find hope. There is only one source, and He was willing to die for you and for me. Why? Because we're so good? No. All of us have chosen to sin. A resounding no. He gave us His blood because He loved us beyond reason. 1 John chapter 3 in the first two verses says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Let's close with prayer. Father, you know how we struggle with believing this principle that we've been talking about today. We know we can relate so well to even the religious leaders in trying to find sin in others' lives and wanting to be accusatory and condemning and wanting others to suffer the consequences of their choices, yet so often forgetting the consequences of our choices. Too many times, Father, we've been people pointing out other people's sins, and we come to you thanking you for the forgiveness that you've given to us because you know our heart and our intent. Yet, Father, all of us have also been in the place of this woman. We've all been caught in our sin, maybe not caught by another person, but you've caught us in every moment. You've seen every reason. You've seen every accusation. You've seen every moment of betrayal. You've seen every darkness of our lives. 
Yet, Father, thank you so much for not condemning us. Thank you, Father, for never abandoning us, for giving us exactly what we need in the truest part and the deepest part of our lives, how you have given us Jesus. Father, thank you so much. May we allow it intellectually to sink into our minds, but may we especially relationally let that sink into our lives and to appreciate each other in the relationship you've given to us as well as for those that are around us. Help us to live out the love we've received from you. In Jesus' name.